the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. This is uh, Michael Denner, professor of Russian studies at Stetson University in Deland, Florida, in the United States, and I've been the editor of the Tolstoy Studies Journal since 2005. I'm recording this essay for the Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group, and I'd like to talk a little bit about Leo Tolstoy and anarchism. Leo Tolstoy, the uh, Russian writer uh, who um, wrote the novels um, War and Peace and Anna Karenina and lots of other stuff. Now, Tolstoy was self-consciously an anarchist. His last 30 years of life were devoted to writing some of the best known and most influential works of political and social criticism from an avowedly anarchical perspective. But today I wanted to dwell on something else, on the aesthetic elements of anarchism in Tolstoy's literature. And I want to make a claim that there is an aesthetic component to anarchism, and that aesthetic was Tolstoy's default artistic mode. That mode was accurately and first described by a young Russian literary critic named Diktor Shklovsky, famous as a founder of formalism in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1917 in a speech that became later a manifesto, and the speech was called Iskustva kak priyom in English, something like art as device. In the most elementary analysis, Shklovsky's essay claims that Tolstoy's device was also the general device of art, and he called that general device, default device of art, astranienia, a word that in English is difficult to translate, but we could say something like the word astranienia in Russian is the process of making something odd or strange. I'll start this podcast by reading a quotation from another famous Russian literary scholar named Boris Eichenbaum, who, like Shklovsky, spent basically the entirety of the 20th century studying Tolstoy. And I'm quoting Eichenbaum here. Tolstoy is truly the canonizer of crisis, the forces of disclosure and destruction lie hidden in almost every one of his devices." End quote. So today I want to talk about Tolstoy as a canonizer of crisis, as a revealer or disclosurer of all things hidden. And in that very specific sense, my claim is that Tolstoy's art should be seen as fundamentally anarchical. So there are actually two claims that we need to unpack. Uh, the first, that anarchy has an aesthetic component, and the second, that Tolstoy's art was inherently anarchical. First of all, let me briefly say that anarchism is usually thought of as a political or social phenomenon. Anarchism rejects authority and power and offers in place of authority and power um, a very positive theory of human flourishing based upon non-coercive, non-hierarchical, consensual political action. That's the usual definition of anarchy. I want to suss out um, the implicitly aesthetic underpinnings of that claim. And, and I'm actually uh, deeply influenced generally by David Graeber, but in particular by David Graeber and David Wingrove's recent book, The Dawn of Everything. The book is like 1,200 pages long, so I'll give you an, admitt an admittedly pocket version, a very motivated version of the book's thesis. And it goes something like this. Essentially, there's only one story that gets told in our Western histories, the history of thought, history of politics, history of philosophy, and its end and denouement are inevitably products of its beginnings and middles. Graeber and Wingrow, um, the former is an anthropologist, or was an anthropologist, and the latter 
is an archaeologist. They, they together examined available evidence that indicates that in the 200,000 odd years of human social interaction, a variety of other social experiments have been tried. Different political arrangements and what I guess is the original Greek meaning of the word. There is a growing consensus. It's diffused and not well known. And this is sort of the point of dawn of everything that in the 200,000 years of human experience, we have tested, experimented directly and lived within alternative political institutions. Yet, because we have so little written or recorded evidence of those disappeared worlds, we end up making an argument in philosophy and history, one that Graeber and Wingrove chart, that the various non-Western or non-modern models that have been in place over the long course of human existence are merely fantasies. They're unreal. For dent of existing evidence, history, or maybe the history of ideas, argues that the present world is inevitable and that the modes that exist now are like physical properties or the laws of nature. We are where we are because we are who we are. Everything is inevitable. Modern political structure is presented as inevitable, natural, and that and that acceptance of the realness and uh, the naturalness of our current way of being in the world reflects a profoundly beggared imagination and also, and this is David Wingrove and David Graeber's point, um, we actually have evidence uh, of these experimentations in political institutions, but we haven't assembled them in a coherent way um, now, I'll admit that this is a very cursory and very motivated abstract of the book, but it's an accurate reflection of the, mains thesis, the, main, the, the, main, the main thesis of the book and its raison d'etre. Implicit in this idea of anarchy, however you want to define it, um, is this idea that the world is actually strange and unnatural, and that it's, in fact, um, it, it merely seems inevitable and coherent. Anarchy, on the other hand, requires the subject to conceive the world in terms of disclosure and destruction, and that this is inevitably a category of perception and therefore an aesthetic mode. That's aesthetikos means in Greek. Um, it's, it's kind of a perception uh, and one that relies on the vacillation between the way that the world is and the world, way that the world might be. And um, so to get to this disclosive artistic power inherent in Tolstoy's literary devices, we need to turn to what is probably the most belabored formless statement concerning the possibility and desirability of radically pure literary study, a study of literature as such. The word in Russian is literaturnost, and when you talk about formalism as a study of art, you um, inevitably, in my field at least, talk about formalism in terms of this idea of pure literary studies. Um, now, the Art as a Device is a very short article. It was actually a, 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 a speech um, that Viktor Shklovsky gave in 1917. It's about a dozen pages. And uh, it's more of a manifesto um, written in 1917 in St. Petersburg amidst the Bolshevik Revolution uh, by a young literary scholar. Um, I guess he would have been about 25 or 26 years old about that time, a graduate student's age. Um, and um, aside from a quick mention of the Russian artist Nikolai Gogol and the Norwegian writer who was very popular at the time, Knut Thompson, all of the examples of pure art in Shklovsky's article are drawn exclusively from Leo Tolstoy. He cites some texts that were very well known in the Russian Empire in 1917, uh, but are basically unknown now. He, for example, he um, cites a political tract called Shame, a short story called Khlstamir, which is a story about a racehorse, often translated into English as Strider. He quotes from Tolstoy's 1860s novel, War and Peace, and from Tolstoy's later works as well, um, from the novel Resurrection and, and from a novella, Kreutzer Sonata, both of those date to the end of the 1890s. 
In addition to these texts, he also cites an extremely obscure passage from Tolstoy's 1897 diary. Um, in fact, a uh, direct citation from Tolstoy makes up about a quarter of the article art as device, not including Shklovsky's extensive commentary on Tolstoy's quotes. Not simplifying um, too much when I say that the basic argument of the manifesto is that there are two ways of seeing the world, uh, an everyday algebraic perception, that's Shklovsky's phrase, algebraic perception, that emphasizes efficiency and effortlessness. And then there's a second mode, an emotive perception, uh, that Shklovsky can claims is an artistic one, and one that emphasizes inefficiency and slowness and produces a revelation. On the face of it, efficiency and convenience of communication seem to be a desirable end. We spend all day perceiving the world, so it makes sense that we, we take a lot of shortcuts. But Shklovsky theorizes that this very efficiency of our everyday perception and communication uh, holds a threat that the algebraic method of communication engenders a similar abstraction in our perceptual process. So uh, this is what Shklovsky writes, and I'm quoting directly from the article here. Uh, we don't really see things, but only recognize them by their primary characteristics. Things pass by us as though they were packed up. Under the influence, such a way of perceiving things dry up. This kind of perception explains why we fail to hear out the ordinary word in its entirety. It also explains our mutual lack of understanding and why we fail to say what we mean. That's the end of the quote. Our tendency in everyday perception, just rehearsing this, um, and communication is to abstract, to reduce reality to convenient categories, and that this tendency breeds what is, in effect, an epistemological illness that Shklovsky calls automatized perception. Our haste to accept what's given as inevitable, as natural, infects our perception of the world. And we begin to see and eventually produce stuff in a sloppy way with no attention to detail. He describes algebraic or automatized perception in a, as a very epigrammatic way, quoting, And so life disappears. It becomes nothing. Automization eats away at things. A dress, furniture, a wife, at the fear of war, end quote. After having recounted these deleterious effects of our convenient way of representing and perceiving the world, Shklovsky reveals about halfway through the article his trump card, his own theory of the function of art. Here, here's, a, here's the quote from, um, from the article, um, quoting from the article. And so art exists in order to return perception to life, to make us feel things, in order to make stone stony. The function of art is to make perception of things not mere recognition, but the device of art is the device of defamiliarizing things. There's that word, astranienia. The device of impeded form, zatrudnienia, which increases the difficulty and duration of perception. The perceptual process in art is the goal in itself, and the process should be drawn out. Art is a means of experiencing the making of a thing. What is made is unimportant." End of quote. So, art's therapeutic effect, this is Shklovsky's claim, derives from its employment of the device of slowing down our usually feckless and too hasty perception, a mode of perception in which we don't really see an object, but simply accept its inevitable existence, its naturalness. On the other hand, intentional artistic perception offers us a vision of the object and its wholeness rather than mere recognition of abstracted parts. Recognition, which is what we do every day, is how lies and falsity creep into the system. And Shklovsky argues that what 
we really need is a vision of something, which only art can produce. We need a vision of an object in order to make stone stony. That's, that's the incredibly famous phrase from Shklovsky's manifesto that goes on to live its own life in Russian literature. What emerges in art as a device, I propose, is a combined epistemological, aesthetic, and moral system that is grounded in the psychology of the elemental process of sense perception and eventually representation. This idea of widespread disharmony traceable to lazy perceptual habits is all the more pressing as Shklovsky makes this claim in a bar in 1917 in St. Petersburg at the height of the Great War and during Russia's revolution, it's winter 1917. Shklovsky, having introduced his theory of automatization or perception, inserts a bunch of quotations now from Tolstoy, first of which is a, a longish quotation drawn from Tolstoy's diary. This is, uh, this is the quote, and I'm going to read it in extenso. Uh, Tolstoy, 19, 1867, quotation from his diary. I was walking about dusting things all around my room. I came to the sofa and I could not recall whether I had already dusted it or not. Since such movements are habitual and unconscious, I feel that it was already impossible to remember if I had in fact dusted the sofa and forgotten that I had done it. So that is to say, if I had acted unconsciously, then it is tantamount to not having done it at all. If someone conscious had seen me doing this, then it might have been possible to restore this in my mind. If, on the other hand, no one had seen me or observed me or had only observed me unconsciously, if the complex life of so many people takes place entirely on the level of unconsciousness, then it's as if life had never been." End quote. These entries uh, Tolstoy made, and, and that, that the quotation is extremely representative of the kind of thinking that Tolstoy does in his diaries. Um, but that particular quotation was made in 1897 while Tolstoy was finishing up a book on aesthetics, which was called um, um, What is Art? Stutkoi Skustva, a book primarily concerned with precisely the themes of art as device, that is to say, um, how do we see things correctly? How do we know that art is um, authentic art and not counterfeit art? And what is ultimately the function of art? Although Shklovsky stopped quoting Tolstoy's diary after the phrase, then it is as if life had never happened. In fact, um, if you look at the diary entry, it goes on. And I'm going to read a little bit further in Tolstoy's 1897 diary, um, something that Shklovsky doesn't quote, but that is included in this diary entry. Um, Tolstoy goes on, therefore life is only life when it is illuminated by consciousness. What is consciousness? What is an act that is illuminated by consciousness? Acts illuminated by consciousness are acts that we perform freely, that we perform knowing that we could have done, we could have acted differently. Therefore, consciousness is freedom. He actually makes up a word there. Um, he makes a kind of hybrid word, consciousness freedom. If we undergo coercion and we have no choice over how we bear this violence, then we will not feel the violence. End quote. In this quote about his couch, Tolstoy, like Shklovsky, posits that we need our perception renewed because unconscious seeing has an aesthetic anesthetizing effect that leaves us ignorant of the fact that we are subject constantly to all sorts of violence and oppression. And our only chance for freedom is to see consciously, to see things as they really are, and therefore to be able to imagine them otherwise. Tolstoy and Shklovsky believe that the way we usually perceive the world stands in need of constant correction because left to its own devices, our perception tends towards automatization and unconsciousness. And therefore, art must exist. There is no possibility for morality or freedom in an unconscious state. The idea that the artist sees and reveals the true nature of a thing a nature that lies hidden beneath the conventional way of seeing the thing. Shklovsky claims that this is the function of true art and that it leads us to a vision of the thing. I, I sense it in the 
um, in Tolstoy's remarks in the dusting scene where Tolstoy introduces the notion of a conscious observer coming as it does among uh, diaries, uh, diary entries related to what is art. I think it is likely that this reference to the role of the artist as a sort of recorder of what other people otherwise overlook or are unconscious of. Again, the word Kolsky uses to describe this function of art is astranienia, which means making something look unfamiliar. And his claim is that Tolstoy is a master practitioner of this, de this device. And as proof of this theory, Shklovsky goes on to quote numerous examples of Tolstoy's attempts to renew and reinvigorate our perceptive faculties. Shklovsky uh, quotes some articles about um, um, corporal punishment, private property, high culture, all seen through the corrective lens of art. Things are de deconstructed, they're taken apart, and um, they are examined in these elemental forms and art is given the task of reassembling these parts. I'll briefly give one example of Shklovsky um, quoting from Tolstoy's article, Shame, about the recently reintroduced practice of public flogging in the Russian Federation. Tolstoy describes it as throwing someone on the ground and stripping them down and spanking them with switches. Tolstoy breaks it down, breaks this, this formal punishment of flogging, um, and makes what seems to be a normal act in, um, into something barbaric, very vaguely reminiscent of grade school paddlings. As the literary critic Walter Benjamin remarks, every artifact of culture is simultaneously an artifact of barbarism. And Tolstoy is constantly at pains to reveal what the thin veneer of civilization really covers. And in this very specific sense, Tolstoy's artistic practice, his fundamental mode is anarchical in the sense that it reveals that what looks to be natural is in fact artificial, strange, counterfeit, inappropriate. Now we've returned to this aesthetic aspect of anarchy. How can we change something? How can we usher in a new reality until we recognize that the way things are is counterfeit? Ultimately, I think Shklovsky and Tolstoy are trying to resolve the same problem. How can their activity, art, art criticism, be morally incorporated into society and leave nothing unexamined? Thank you. Thank you for listening. To help others find anarchist essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.